carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. So that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. And this is the most important part. Also, seek the peace of, and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if the city prospers, you too will prosper. Amen? You may be seated. May the Lord bless his word. Now, George III, king of England, he had a diary. Diary? Diary. I have my English professor here, Victor Jr. Diary. Thank you. Uh, he, will, he, he, will, he, he will write on, on that book. That's easy. Every day. And on July 4th, 1776, he wrote, Nothing important happened today. July 4th, 1776. Of course you know what happened that day. But George III, he had no idea. There was no communication. You know, there was no cell phones, iPhones, or, you know, internet. He, he had no idea. There was no... Oh, there's no way for him to know that a couple of thousand miles away in America, 56 individuals were signing, pledging their honor, their fortune, their honor, into the Declaration of Independence for the United States of America. And they were signing a document that, as you heard in, in the video, one of the, the sections goes like this. We hold this truth to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that we are, and forgive, forgive me if I don't pronounce the words right, endowed by their creator with certain and honorable rights, <laughs> that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure those rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. And what is important about the Declaration of Independence, one of the things that is important is that 56 individuals from all different backgrounds got together trying to protect, trying to look out for the benefit of the new nation. Most people believe that all the founding fathers were Christian, and that's not necessarily true. A bunch of them were Christians, evangelicals. Other words, at least three of them were Roman Catholics. And others, they, you know, they, they believe in God, but they, they were not necessarily Christian people. What I'm trying to say is that when they got together, and you're going to see later in the Constitution of the United States, that according to what I was reading, uh, there's no moral or religious qualification for the president of the United States. These people were not trying to put together a document about religion, about Christianity. They were thinking about the, f the future of the people in America, the civil uh, life, the political life, because they understood from the beginning that there was supposed to be a separation between church and state. Now, a lot of people... And I, and I want to say something. This has been one of the most difficult sermons for me to prepare because it's a very sensitive subject. But I promise you, I am not going to tell you to vote for this candidate or for the other one. That's not my job. I am not going to tell you to su support you know, the Democrats or the Republicans. I'm not going to tell you who you're supposed to vote for. But I, I'm going to try to find some answers in the Bible, some guidelines that will help us to make a wise decision when we go to, to the uh, election site on November 8th. A lot of people go to the Bible. They go to the Bible, you know, to the Old Testament, and they see how Israel was a theocracy. You know, you know that word, theocracy? Uh, uh, people where God was the ruler, where God was the king, 
you know, democracy is supposed to be a government ruled by the people, which is not always the case. But Israel was at the beginning a theocracy. And, and people believe that we need to take the moral and spiritual standards of the Old Testament and apply to any candidate for the president, for the governor, for the senate, because, you know, according to this point of view, these people need to be held accountable based on, uh, on the basis of the Bible, because in the Old Testament they find, for example, uh, verses like Deuteronomy 16:19 that says, do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the innocent. And people say, you know, you see, if you're going to vote for a, for a president today, if you're going to vote for a governor today, you know, they, they have to, to be in line with the word of God in the Old Testament. They have to be honorable people, decent people, etc. You understand the point, right? And other people are going to say, well, in the Old Testament, in order for you to be king, you need to obey God. You need to follow God's uh, laws because in First Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, when God rejects uh, Saul, I'm sorry, the, the king Saul, because he did, he did not obey the word of God, the Bible, God told him for rebellion is like the sin of uh, divination and arrogance, like the evil of idolatry, because he has rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. And, and people go, you see? In order for us to have a king, a president, in order for us to have you know, a governor, blah, 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 they, they have to obey the, the word of God and so on. Now, I'm going to tell you something that it may be shocking to you, and I hope nobody gets up and leaves you know, <laughs> the meeting today because of that. Israel was supposed to be a theocracy in the, where, while they were living in the promised land. As far as God was the king... God was the ruler. They were supposed to live a life, uh, and the civil life, the, the, the politics and everything was subject to the word of God. But that changed when Israel was no longer in the promised land. And even uh, as a nation of God, if you remember, from the moment that they asked for a king, and we're going to see that in a minute. From the moment that they asked for a human king, and Israel was no longer a theocracy, but a... Uh, monarchy, thank you. If you see the story, you know, 99%, to put a number, of the kings were evil. You know, the, it was not easy to find one president, to put it that way, somebody who was in charge, that it was in line with the word of God. You know, once humans get into the equation, things go bad. And even the people of God, even in, in Jerusalem and, and, and in other places, once they had humans running for office, it was very difficult to find one person that will qualify with all the requirements uh, to be, you know, a model for Christianity, for God, and to be in office. Something is going to happen. One day, Babylon is going to invade Jerusalem, and they're going to take a bunch of people, the majority of people, to Babylon. You remember that story? And it's in that setting where we find the, the, the scripture that we just read. Because now Israel is in a foreign land with a pagan king, with pagan people, listening to pagan music, pagan laws, uh, surrounded by a culture, by a, a society that was totally against God. You follow me? And you would think that God will tell the people, well... Now you have to convert the king. Now you have to you know, lobby in such a way that they change the rules of Babylon so they become a Christian nation or a godly nation. Now you're going to have to you know, work hard uh, to make sure that the governors and the king and the laws of the country will be in line with the word of God because now you are my people and you are in a foreign land. Foreign land. But... And some people would think that God would say, well, well don't worry. I'm going to take you out of there. I'm going to get you out of that culture. I'm going to get you out of that setting, that uh, pagan world, you know, uh, out, out of, of that evil culture. And I'm going to take you to a place where you can flourish as a nation under the guidance and the blessing of God. But that's not what we saw, right? If you, let's read it again. 
when God, through the prophet, is addressing the people, he's telling them, you know what, guys? Get comfortable because you're not going anywhere. All right? Buy a house. You know, plant some avocados in the backyard so you can make guacamole. Get, get, uh, get married. Have kids, grandkids. You know, get a job. Put a taco truck in the corner, whatever. Do whatever you need to do. And they were supposed to pray for the king. They were supposed to be good citizens. They were supposed to be uh, model citizens. They were supposed to uh, behave like, like the nation of God because... Israel in exile is very similar to what happened to the early church. You remember when Christ established this church? He did not establish the church to be part of the culture, to the church of Jesus Christ for five centuries at least. The king, uh, the church was not supposed to thrive in an environment that, that was positive for them. It was all the opposite. You follow me? The church was in evil uh, laws that were against the church, against the people of God. They, they, they went to jail. They got killed. They suffered. But and God, God was very proud of his people. And to be honest with you, and most scholars would agree with me, the worst thing that happened to the church was when Rome, Rome became Christianized. That, that was the worst thing that happened because the church that was thriving, the church that was growing, you know, people, you had to be a very good believer to, to, to say that you were a believer in the Roman Empire. And that happens to the church in the beginning. And that is exactly what's happening with the church today. We are in America. Other churches are in other countries. But I will dare you. I will bet that it, through history and today, it's, it's going to be very difficult, very unlikely, that you're going to find a country, a society, a culture, where the church is living in, that the laws, the president, the governors, the people in office are going to be morally in line with the word of God, the spiritual people, people that love God. Yes, we have some cases, you know, that this guy is a Christian, that other president may be a Christian, but in general, Jesus established his church not to influence, necessarily change the society, the culture around it, but to establish the kingdom of God because just as Israel was in exile in Babylon, just as the early church was uh, a foreigner, they were foreigners, they were, they were aliens, they were pilgrims in, in, in that pagan world. Today, the church is in the same place. We are not citizens of this world. We are not citizens of this country. Our, our kingdom, our citizenship is in the heavens. And we are here... And it doesn't matter if the king is evil, in this case the president. It doesn't matter who is going to be elected president tomorrow. It doesn't matter what kind of congress we have. It doesn't matter what kind of laws we have. It will be great. It will be nice. It will be ideal that the church can influence the lawmakers and, and, and we can have things in place in line with the word of God. But if I was you, I won't get my hopes too high. Because history has shown, and even the Bible will show you, that things are going to get worse. Things are going to get bad for us. We are not going to live in any society in, in, right now or in the future where the king is going to be Christian, the president is going to be Christian, the Congress is going to be Christian, the laws are going to be in line with the word of God, the morality is not going to be there, the ethics uh, and, and everything that has to do with the word of God. Now, it is interesting that when Paul is writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, I urge, I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all 
godliness and holiness. If you remember, this, the setting was the Roman Empire, one of the most evil societies, uh, in, uh, some of the most ruthless kings. And what Paul is not telling the church, you, you need to try to convert the king, you need to try to... Uh, uh, God did not brought the church into existence to be a civic theocracy, but a spiritual theocracy. The church is supposed to be a spiritual theocracy, not a civic or political theocracy, because it's very unlikely that we're going to live, that we're going to function in a society, in a country, where the laws, the governors, the, the presidents, and everybody else is going to be in line with the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying so far? Later, uh, the Apostle Paul is going to tell, uh, I'm sorry, the Apostle Peter, in, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, he's going to say that we need to honor the king. That we need to honor the king. And none of those kings at that time were morally, you know, people. They, they were not good people. They, they were evil people. And he's telling the church, we need to honor the king. And in that same verse, he's going to say that the slaves are supposed to honor the masters. He doesn't say if they're good, if they are Christian people, if they are godly people. The, the, the church is supposed to function as the, as the church of God, as the people of God, regardless of what kind of president we have, what kind of government we have, what kind of society, what kind of culture we have. If you remember also, Paul, he's going to write to the church in, in Rome. Paul is going to tell the people in Romans chapter 13 that the primary responsibility of the civil that the civic authority is to promote good and restrain evil. And at that time, Nero was the emperor. Now, if you don't know who Nero was, just remember this. A lot of people today are named Paul, Peter. Nobody named their kids Nero. They, they saved that name for the dogs. <laughs> Only the dogs are named Nero. And, and this was the guy that eventually is going to kill Paul. And this is the guy who's going to be the ruler at that time. And the church was supposed to honor the king. The church was supposed to pray for the king. The church was supposed to pay the taxes. The church was supposed to live under the same conditions that Israel in Babylon, in exile, was supposed to live. The early church was supposed to live in the same way. And we are supposed to live. We cannot expect way for, for the loss of the country. Wait for the, for the president to be a godly man. We are not supposed to wait for, for, for the, our, the culture to reflect the values of Christianity. The church of Jesus Christ is, the main goal is to preach the gospel, impact the lives of people, and keep moving forward knowing that our citizenship is in a different world, in, in, in a different kingdom, spiritual kingdom. So I'm going to tell you six Guidelines. Again, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to defend one candidate, or one party. I'm just going to give you six guidelines that it may help you on November 8th when you go to vote. Now, if you are not going to vote because you are underage, maybe these principles will tell you because we will continue in our lives, if we are alive, uh, going through this process. And it's very important that the church get involved, that the church will get engaged in the political process. But sometimes, you know, we need some guidelines. Number one, the, the first advice that I want to give you is do not put your trust in people, but put your trust in God. E even the money says in God we trust, right? <laughs> we don't trust in the money. <laughs> we trust in God. What does that mean? I, I have news for you. If Trump gets elected, it's very unlikely that he's going to make your life personally better. If Hillary Clinton is elected, it's very unlikely that he's going to make your life in particular better. And if, if he does, praise the Lord. But we don't, our hope, our future, our trust is not in the president. It's not in who's going to be the next president. It's not going to be based on Congress. It's not going to be based on what kind of laws. Because at the end of the day, whether it's a good law or a bad law, people are going to do whatever they want. 
It will be great to have laws that will protect the children. It will be great to have laws that will protect the freedom of religion. It will be great to have laws that are in line with the word of God, with the Bible. But at the end of the day, just because we have laws, people are not going to seek after God. And just because we have bad uh, uh, laws you know, prohibiting this or that, at the end of the day, people are going to do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter what the law says. So we, we are supposed to do what the Bible says in Psalm 146, 3 through 6. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings, in presidents, in governors. They cannot save. When they die, that's what it says, that when they, the spirit departs, they go to the ground. And that's it. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is in the God of Jacob. Whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth. The sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Our trust is in the God Almighty. We don't care what's going to happen tomorrow. And believe me, nothing is going to happen. I mean, we may have, you know, a few things here and there. But life, it will go on after November 8th. And it doesn't matter who becomes elected. Your future, your finances, your, your kids' education, your provision, your life. is You cannot put your trust on the president, on the political party. Your trust is supposed to be on God. Israel went through something similar one day. You know, they had a referendum. You know what a referendum is? By the way, if I'm not mistaken, there is going to be a referendum in New Jersey the day of election about casinos in, in New Jersey. You, you, you heard about that? You're supposed to vote yes or no on a question whether the, the government, whoever is going to be allowed to move casinos from Atlantic City, that's the only city that is allowed to have casinos, to the northern New Jersey, the central New Jersey. This is a position that I don't have even to tell you how to vote because 70%, according to the last polls, 70% of the citizens of New Jersey are, going, are against that, against expanding the casinos in this uh, state. But one day, Israel uh, went to Samuel, the prophet, and said, you know what, we want a king. You know, everybody has a king. We are the only one. And the prophet goes to God and says, hey, God, you know, these people are giving me a hard time. They, they don't want you as a king. They want a king because they, they want a king that will protect them, a king that will fight for them, a, a king that will provide financial security. And God said, listen, to all that the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. You know what the problem was? The problem was that these people were taking their eyes of God and placing their eyes upon a human ruler. They, they were saying, God, you know, uh, we don't trust you that, we're gonna, that you're going to protect us. We don't trust you that you're going to provide for us. Or if you provide for us, we don't want to do it on your timetable. You know, we want it and we want it now. You know, we want to have our king. We want to do this, we want to that. And we will we'll feel better if we have a human person being our king. And even though we, we may not say it like that, but sometimes with our acts, the way we behave, the way we talk about politics, the way we interact, uh, the way we think, is sometimes it's like we, our last hope is the president. Our last hope is the government. Our last hope is that program, is that law that we believe is going to make our life better. But I, I'm here to repeat and remind you that we trust in God and God alone. Number two, please don't get into arguments about politics. What, what do I mean by that? We can talk. You know, I can give you my opinion. You can give me your opinion. We can have different point of view. Because believe me, you've seen pastors, evangelical pastors out there on TV defending Donald Trump. There are pastors, evangelical leaders out there defending, supporting Hillary Clinton. And they both will find something in the Bible to say we are right. Correct? And you have friends, co-workers, family members that they don't think like you, that they are supporting the other candidate. Correct? Why are you going to get into a fight? 
Why are you going to become enemies with your, with your family? Because you have a different position on politics. After November, whoever wins, you know, Donald Trump is going to be in his mansion, Hillary Clinton is going to be in, on her plane, and you're going to be stuck with your neighbor, with your wife, your kids. <laughs> And it doesn't matter what happens, you know, and I, and I had, there was an incident the other day. I have a friend who live, who live in Florida, and every week he will take me through WhatsApp. He will send me stuff about his candidate, about his political party. He didn't know that I was on the other side. So one day I said, you know what, I'm going to answer to this guy. So I wrote something to him. And uh, he got so upset, you know, how can you think like that? How can you gonna do that? Don't you know? Blah, blah, blah. And he started bombarding me with all kinds of articles and pictures and jokes. And I was like, you know, if your candidate wins, I'll buy your lunch. If my win, I'll buy your lunch. I was trying to be nice to the guy. But one day I got sick and tired, so I saw a very mean joke in the internet about his candidate. And I sent it to him. He didn't speak to me for a week. I thought that was, that was going to be the end of our relationship. Finally, he came back with some emojis laughing, and, and we started talking again. I think it was Andy Stanley who says, engage in respectful conversation. Listen to people's opinion, other people's opinions that are different. Learn from them. Be a student, not a critic. We don't have to agree, and, and especially in the church. You know, are you going to get in a fight with your brother and sister because he doesn't support your candidate or your political party? Listen, unless they promise you an embassy, unless they are paying you to, do, to campaign for them, that would be okay. You know, they're paying you. They're gonna, you're going to be the ambassador if they win. I understand. But they're not going to do anything for you. They, you, know, nothing is gonna, you can have your position. You can have your point of view. And we can talk about it. But we're not supposed to fight. First Timothy 2.8, the Bible says, Therefore, I want, them, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting holy hands without anger or disputing. There's no need to get in trouble for somebody that probably is not going to do anything for you tomorrow. Do, do you get the point? Number three, number three, you knew this already. There are not perfect candidates. To me, it's so funny that a brother in Christ will come to me and say, I'm going to vote for this person because he or she believes this about the Bible. And I will say, I can name 20 or 40 positions or beliefs that he or she has that are against the Bible. And that goes for Trump, and that goes for Hillary, and for the Libertarian, and the, the Green Party, or whoever. The, it, unless, you know, Jesus Christ comes down and he runs for president, I guarantee you, you're never going to have a Christian perfect candidate that's going to run for office, that's going to run for governor. You, are, you cannot say, oh, I'm going to pick and choose, you know, uh, cher cher cherry picking, is it? Uh, oh, this position or that position, because none of them are individuals that are in line with the word of God, that are... are, are that, that you can consider Christians and things like that. And number four, and this is very important, you need to put people before politics. Jesus did that. When Jesus came, Jesus was not a, a Republican. Jesus was not a Democrat. Jesus was not running for office. Jesus didn't care about the king, about the government. He, he wanted to establish his kingdom, and he always put people first before politics. Luke chapter 10, you remember, he was telling the people, you need to love God with all your strength, and, so, and you need to love your enemy, your, your neighbor, as yourself. The Bible is very clear that when it comes to politics and everything else, we need to think about, we are not supposed to be selfish. Oh, I'm going to vote for this guy because he's going to make, uh, avo, avo, you know, I love avocado, you probably know that. He's going to make avocado the national fruit of the country. And, and, and that probably is going to be a disaster for the economy. But that's what I like, so I'm going to vote for him. I'm not thinking about the people. I'm not thinking about my, you know, you know, uh, the, the other people. I'm just giving you an example. You can, you can do anything you want. You can put any example you want. We need to think about the welfare of the majority. We need to think about what's going to be the future of this country. And I'm going to give you another example that is it's a little tough. Let's say, for, for argument's sake, that you convince somebody to vote for Hillary. 
right? You, con you talk to them, you, you press them, and they vote for her. And then she becomes president, and, and she does something that will affect the life, the, the job, the business of that person. To me, you are responsible for that. Let's, 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 let's uh, use Trump. Let's say that you convince people to vote for Trump, and, and you press them, and you insist because you believe that he's the candidate, and then he becomes president, and he does something, I don't know, he deport everybody, <laughs> and, and, and your friend, your family member ends up in a very bad situation because he or she did that. You see what I'm trying to say? You don't want to be in that position. Everybody is supposed to use their own common sense. We need to pray to God to give us direction, give us wisdom. And we're supposed to go out there and vote. Not because this candidate believes in God, because none of them believe in God, because none of them are Christian, because none of them are in line with the word of God. That has never been the case through history. And I remember, you remember, there was a Christian evangelical president in this country, and it was a disaster when it comes to economy. The way you keep your faith in front of your politics is by putting people first and politics second. Five, five the Constitution should be a priority. What does that mean? Uh, whenever it's possible, we need to support the candidate, most committee, to a constitutionally limited government. These people that got together in 1776, they were not thinking about religion. They were not thinking about the morality or the spiritual life of, of, of the individuals. They were thinking about the benefit and the welfare of the city, of the citizens, of, of, of the people of this country. God told Israel in Babylon, seek the peace and the prosperity of the, of the city. Because if the city prospers, you will prosper. And, and the early church did the same thing, and we are supposed to do the same thing. And finally, isn't that a beautiful word? Finally, we need to vote. Now, if you did not register, if you are not voting, shame on you. But you can do it next time because there's going to be a lot of elections, God willing. But let me, give you, let me tell you something. When you go to vote, I think it was somebody who wrote the other day, and I think it's, you may not like this, but choosing to vote for a candidate, knowing that they won't get more than 5%, is the same as not voting. What, what, what do we mean by that? Some people are going to say, well, I don't like this, I don't like that, so I'm not going to vote for anybody. I don't think that's an option. Or I'm going to vote for, for the little guy, knowing that he's not going to go anywhere. That is throwing your vote away. So what's the use? Some people say, well, that's, I'm, I'm making a statement. You know, I'm making a statement that I, I'm against the system, I'm against this and that. But, you know, I'm sorry to put it this way, uh, but in Spanish we say, votar por el menos malo, uh, for the less, to vote for, 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 the less, for the lesser of two evil, right? Unfortunately, sometimes that's what it comes to. We need to vote for a president, for a candidate, that uh, at least, it, we don't expect him to be a Christian, we don't expect him to be you know, to move laws that are going to benefit the church because that's not going to happen. It, 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 we have a Congress, we have, uh, we, have, we have referendums, and anything. We need to vote for a candidate that at least will respect the Constitution, will seek the, you know, will look out for, for, for the majority of the people, that uh, will put policies in place that will benefit the majority of people. But we need to go out there and vote because there are some numbers out there, some statistics that are a big number of Christians, they don't get involved. They don't get engaged. They don't vote. They think that you know, they're supposed to be, uh, to live uh, away from, from society, from the culture, from the, from the system. And your vote can make a difference you know, at the end of the day. But let, I'm going to end saying that we are looking for a kingdom that can be shaken. A kingdom that will never end. America is not our kingdom. Your country is not your kingdom. Yet we must keep seeking the welfare of our country but vote by voting for the candidate that will enact policies to promote good and restrain evil according to the biblical norms. And that's the way we're supposed to go about. I hope that I give you some points that I give you some guidelines. May the Lord uh, lead us, give us wisdom, 
uh, as, as we go to the voting place on November 8th. And let's just keep moving forward, doing what we need to do as a church. Preaching the gospel, impacting people's lives, seeking the kingdom of God, and God will have mercy in our country. Amen? Let us stand. Vamos a, let us stand. We're going to finish. We're going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what we find in scriptures. We bless your name and we ask you that you give us wisdom, knowing that there is no perfect candidate, that we cannot put our trust in humans, that our trust is only in you, that uh, we are living in a pagan society, that we have evil rulers and presidents and, and people that are not necessarily in line with the uh, moral values of the Christian faith. But we believe that uh, the church, what we do, the way we vote, and the way we promote our faith can make a difference. So we ask you that, that you will help us to keep the peace, the prosperity of our country, that you will make sure that nothing bad happens after the election, that you restrain evil, and that all the people involved in politics will seek and desire and work for the benefit of the people. If there is anybody here today that has not accepted you as Lord and Savior, allow that person to become a believer today. And thank you for everything that you're doing and everything that you are about to do. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.